No, you can only record it. Just it's recording, it's recording it. Okay. You know, like when you go to the dentist and they say this won't hurt a bit. <laughs> <laughs> this won't hurt a bit. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Tired. Yeah, yeah. I, Already. I cut the grass, did two loads of clothes. That'll do it, man, especially in this heat, you know. I uh, painted 12 mini paintings <laughs> for this order I had to get out by tomorrow. Wow, you're doing commission Packed work. all my shit up, drove all the way down here, loaded it up there myself. Wow. So. You're working hard, man. <laughs> you're working really hard. <laughs> Well, if you want to be a musician, that's what you're yeah, going to do. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. It's funny, I wanted to be a musician to get out of working. I obviously had no clue what I was doing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I do what I was getting into. Well, I think we're ready to get started, man. Okay, my guest has spent over 70 years composing, performing, and recording the blues as a member of many bands, including, and stop me if I'm wrong here, including Mojo Mark IV. Sawbuck, Initial Shock, The Chosen Few, and most recently with Triple Vision. In addition to that, you've also played with the likes of Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Muddy Waters, Santana, Steve Miller, Chuck Berry, and countless others. It's my pleasure to have Mojo Collins here. Did I leave anyone out? Me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping for me a lot of times. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I know how that goes. <laughs> so I, I read uh, in one of your previous interviews, you say you got your first lessons from your grandmother playing uh, an old guitar. Yeah, yeah, when I was three years old, she had a Stella tenor mm -hmm. guitar. And, uh, what is a Stella? She used to let me comb her hair. It was five feet long, and she was five feet tall, so it was all the way to the floor every time, and it was really cool. And in return for combing her hair, she taught me how to play a few chords. Nice. And as well as uh, your grandmother played and your, your father, Wild Bill, was... Uh, all my aunts, uncles, and cousins all played. It was a musical family. So what would you say, what did you gain from your inherited knowledge? Do you feel it was passed down to you? Well, my dad told my oldest sister who wanted to be a musician. She was a really fine cellist. And... Uh, he told her not to get in music because it sucked. Uh, kind of told me the same thing, but I, I was persistent mm -hmm. to want to learn and emulate my dad. Yeah. He was one of the greatest guitarists to ever come out of North Carolina. And he helped pioneer country, rock, folk, blues, jazz in the Triangle area for 40 years before from the 20s right on up to the 60s and 70s. He died when he was in 81. He uh, played with all the biggies, uh, Chet Atkins, Merle Travis, uh, Roy Clark, Grandpa Jones, Manny Pearl. Anytime the, uh, the Grand Ole Opry would come on tour, they'd always call him to back him up. He was really good. And great inspiration. Mm -hmm. I called him Wild Bill. Yeah. Uh, what was it like playing music with your father? It was I rarely ever saw my father. He worked yeah. three jobs. He was a truck driver and a, a shoe repairman and a musician. So he was always yeah. going out the door. Right. I guess you know something about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned that from him. <laughs> yeah. I understand. I understand. Um, so would you say that music is in your blood? Uh, my life is nothing but music, and yeah. I, I live the beat of the rhythm, and I drive the road. Yeah, yeah. I hear that. I hear that. Um, I read that your dad was involved in doing some local television, uh, WTVD. In Durham, yeah. And that you had your first television appearance at what, eight years old? Uh, no, I was actually uh, 11 years You're old. 11. I was teaching guitar uh, to my friends in school. And uh, they all saw my dad on TV every Saturday night. So I was kind of like, hey, we need to take lessons from Mojo. <laughs> but I wouldn't call Mojo then, I would just call Bill. <laughs> 
You know, uh, my, uh, the reason I was named Bill is because my daddy owes so much he named me Bill. I always say that at the post office when I go to pick up my bills. You know, it gets a chuckle every time. But uh, it's the truth. We, I went to seven schools one year. Every yeah. time the rent came due, we'd have to move. Yeah. Five kids with a couple of hangers on, mom and dad. It was a, it was a tough go, man. But we got through it. It definitely makes you tougher later in life, life. you know. You, is what you learn I think early it, on yeah. when they pass the biscuits, yeah. you always yeah. take three or four because they're not coming around again. <laughs> and so what was it like when you saw your dad on television? Did you just think this is normal? Everyone's dad is on TV? Uh, no, I was real proud of him. Yeah, yeah. And he was just such a fine uh, musician and person that everybody loved him. Yeah. So... Uh, was, he was my inspiration mostly before I discovered Muddy Waters. Huh. That's great. That's great. And, and what did, how would you describe like the early days of television? You know, you were in these studios. They had these enormous cameras. They had, you know, what was that experience like for you? Um, Being under the hot lights. Uh, I was a little was, nervous the first uh, time. I sweated a lot. But they had a nice looking lady that came up and dabbed my forehead and dried off the sweat, <laughs> put a little powder on me. <laughs> Son, you're a little pale. <laughs> and this was live television, I assume, right? Yeah, well, it, she did that before I went on. Uh -huh. But but you went on the air yeah, live, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was called Saturday Night Country Style. Wow. And uh, it was Jim Thornton, Saturday Night Country Style. Jim Thornton and Home of Briar were two rivals in the triangle. Both of them played country and western music. They both had country western clubs and they both had TV shows. One was in Durham with, and the other one was in Raleigh, WRL TV. So my dad would play in between the two. Yeah. Played with both of them for years and years. The show at RAL was called uh, Daybreak. They went on at five o'clock in the morning. A lot of times he never even slept that night from driving somewhere. But, you know, he uh, loved to play. Yeah. You know, sort of sacrifice that you have to make if you really want to be a musician. Yeah, there's no question about that. It's one that. thing yeah. to strum a guitar, but it's another yeah. thing to get out there and make a living at it. No question about that. You know, that's what separates the boys from the men. Well, you love it. you got to love it. It just comes with the territory. Right. <laughs> And um, your father was a great musician, but he was also a great showman. How much about performing and about show business did you learn from him? Well, this is a long time before Stevie Ray was ever thought of, but my dad played it behind his back, behind his neck. Wow. He learned it from T-Bone Walker, he told mm -hmm. me, who was a great black blues player, showman, extraordinary. Yeah did all the stuff that Chuck Berry ripped off from it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and my dad, yeah, you know, learned those tricks too. He was able to do all that. And, you know, I, I, I have at one time been able to do something like that, but I'm not that much of a showman anymore. Oh, I disagree. I, I think that you're, that you're really quite a showman, and uh, I really respect the fact that you are equal parts musician and entertainer, and, um, yeah, I just wanted to pay you that compliment. Thank but you. but yeah, but the follow up question though that I have with that is how much do you consider yourself to be a musician or an entertainer? You know, how would you split split that divide? One is fifty and the other is fifty, I guess. Mm -hmm. you, you just kinda of split it down the middle and then go with whichever one is rolling. Yeah. And uh if you get too far over on that one, you probably need to lean the other way and right, right. straighten up and get back on the other one so you're leveled out. A lot of people I knew in the music business used to lean the the wrong way to the drugs and the attitude and uh, I'm bigger than the you are and that kind of thing. And I, I got to witness all that and I learned a lot from that. And the fact that I'm still here shows me that, you know, I, I'm a strong person and I just 
I want to praise God for, for giving me the talent and blessing me with such a great life. Yeah. And blessing you with the drive as well. Yeah, so I do have so a drive. Hard. It's still yeah. there. That's I lost it about well. a year ago with the heart thing, but it's taken about 15 months. I'm, I'm back, though. And how are you feeling in general? On that? I feel good, man. Mm -hmm. I need a cigar and a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> I know you got one for me. <laughs> After the show. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> if Willie was here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm really I'm glad to see that you're doing well, and and I think that you sound as good as you ever did. I mean, um, well, thank you. Yeah, I still love to play, and that's what that comes out. Those guys I play with, the Jolly Boys, Chris and Bill, they've been with me now almost eight years, eight seasons. So it's like uh, it's it's got that Stevie Ray Vaughan tightness to it, you know, just a trio and go at it. Yeah, the two guys you play with, Bill and Chris. I met them, delightful guys, yeah. brothers. So they they've been playing together a long time. Four years. Yeah, they have. And hobbies. I found them both in the church. Wow. I couldn't find any musicians that weren't messed up on his own. Mm -hmm. So I played solo for so long when I first moved here in '73. I've been down here a long time now, 46 years. Yeah. yeah. You know. Uh, when I turned 70 years old, <laughs> I sat down and counted up how many days it was, and it was 25,540 days. And I said, well, that 70 doesn't sound too old compared to 25,540. <laughs> My wife said, I'm a little <laughs> off to the right or something. <laughs> it's all how you look at things. <laughs> How would you describe the difference between when you play by yourself and you accompany yourself and you play in a band? What is what's the major difference for you? It's a lot more work solo for me now. I'm older. I can't stomp the box like I used to. But I, I, I like playing with the band better because they give me something to float over. Sure. And it's a lot easier for me to play an electric guitar than yeah. it is an acoustic all night. And I have paid some dues on some guitars. <laughs> I ain't kidding you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. As somebody that plays in a band and also plays on their own, it's a lot easier when you got Yeah, a lot of times I get to uh, combine the two yeah. on concerts. and. Uh, well, you open for yourself, as you said. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we've got this little thing going where I didn't do it at Turner's, but I, I did it, do it on, if we're doing an outside show where I play by myself for a while, then I'll say, hey, I picked up this guy, Hitchcock, and he come on play some bass guitar with me. <laughs> and then he'll come up and play a couple. And I said, there was a guy playing drums right over here. I, can he come up? And then we kind of get the whole thing rolling. Uh, people seem to like it, you know, they kind of chuckle. Yeah. I, I think they know, but <laughs> right. they're pretending like they don't. But anyway, just something that came off the cuff. So you didn't always just play guitar. You started out playing some different instruments and some different styles, right? I started out playing spoons. Wow. And uh, spoons, then it was tambourine, then it was back porch singing with them when they jam on Sundays. And then I picked up the guitar and my dad also showed me some boogie-woogie piano. I'm also a pianist. Yeah. Not a great one, but I've written a couple of dozen songs on the piano that sound completely different than the guitar work. And I, I like diversification in my sound. So when you're listening to me, you're really listening to 100, 200, 300, maybe 1,000 different musicians that I've been around and played with or learned from. A little bit from each one. And what do you think it is about the guitar that made you choose that instrument? Mostly because my dad had that 54 Stratocaster. Mm -hmm. It's worth about 100000 now. <laughs> do you know where that Stratocaster yeah, is Yeah, it's in the collector in Reno, Nevada. Oh, yes, it got go stolen. Visit. 
31 years ago. Well, it got stolen the day he died, September 20th, 1981. And it wound up in Reno. It took me 31 years to find it. A collector has it. He only has 67,000 on it. Uh, you can't file a claim? He said if I had the serial number, it was mine, but I didn't have it. I didn't have it recorded. Anyway, it's there. I found it. You know, still had the tobacco burns up here where he put his cigars and cigarettes. And uh, I, I, I play a strat to this day because he did. He started out with a 54 gold top Les Paul because him and Les Paul were friends. And he got one of the very first gold tops, number four, I think. Wow. He said it was too heavy on his gigs, and he went and traded it for that Strat, 54 Strat, and it was six or eight pounds lighter than the Les Paul, which helped him immensely, because you know, he played a lot and traveled a lot. Um, your first band uh, came out of your stint in the Air Force. That seems kind of a roundabout way to go things. How did that come about? I was stationed in Glasgow, Montana in 1962. And uh, I was, when I first went there, I was an air policeman. Spit shine, pistol, nightclub, standing at the front gate with the white gloves directing traffic with a whistle and it got old quick. So I cross trained into food service, became a chef. And I used to cook for all the colonels and generals when they come in. It was a SAC base, uh, Strategic Air Command. And uh, I'd always cook for them. They come in sometimes at three o'clock in the morning on a flight and say, I'm hungry, and they'd get me up and I'd go cook for them. But they all love me, man, because I'd give them big old T-bones and mashed potatoes and gravy, and I, I could cook about any old days. I, I used to cook for 9,000 people three times a day, and I did that tour for uh, two and a half years, and it was 55 below zero both winters. And a couple of my friends actually froze to death, lost in a snow drift during my tenure there in Glasgow Air Force Base. So uh, I, when I got out, they wanted me to re-up and go to the Philippines. This was before Vietnam. And uh, I didn't. I decided not to and just went out and got me a bottle and found me a, a warning and holed up in a hotel room <laughs> up in Glasgow <laughs> for a couple of weeks to get, try to get rid of that funk. <laughs> I enjoyed serving my country, man, and I did it, and I'm a veteran, and I'm proud of it. I just, I do a lot of benefit work for veterans. They deserve every mm -hmm. bit they can get, man. And I'm one of them. Thank me for my service. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Man. Both of my uncles were, they were chefs in the Navy too, so like I, I, I got hear you, stories I got you, so they were Everybody's got their little... Uh, well, just, yeah, I just know how popular, you you know, when you're the guy with the food, you know, there's a lot yeah, of Yeah, and I could play the that, guitar too, that too that and that really that got it. <laughs> and so the, the Mojo Mark IV, this is where you took your name from, this is... Um, no, I'm at Muddy Waters in the bus station in Chicago on the way to my assignment in Glasgow. I rode a bus. I, Eastern Airlines was on strike, so I had to take a bus to my assignment, 2,500 miles. And, you, and, you and I, when I got there, I said, I ain't ever riding a bus again. Good choice. And, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there was a big snowstorm, and I got stuck there, and McKinley Morganfield was sitting there, man. And I got to meet him and jam with him, and he told me I had a lot of soul for a white boy. So when I got to the bass, I, I bought his record. I was all jacked up and learned some of his songs and put a, a little band together and we played in town at some little dive, mostly for the locals who hated military because they'd run off with all their women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there were a few brawls during that tenure there for a couple of years. I, I, one of them I got smashed with a garbage can lid, a metal one knocked me out, woke up, and somewhere else <laughs> in the brig. Anyway, 
So I uh, started Mojo's Mark IV. There were four black fellows in, in my uh, squadron, the cook uh, food service squadron, that showed uh, interest in playing with me, a drummer, a keyboard player, and a bass player, and a singer. So I was the only white guy in the band. I'm singing Marty Waters. <laughs> back in the yeah. You know, it was kind of ironic. And... Uh, so I, I got the nickname Mojo from doing Mojo working and just getting turned on to the blues, you know, the real blues. Because all the music, music I listened to coming up was mostly country and Elvis and, and rock, that, that kind of rockabilly, you know. It wasn't, I didn't really see where the root came from until my daddy showed me the boogie woogie piano. Boom, mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. That's the blues, the basic. And in the blues, I tell everybody that plays with me, less is more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is the, the magic of it, is the sparsity of it. I think that's why. Yeah, yeah like money could get more out of one note on that slide than a lot of guitar players do in a whole song. The blues is sung by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways, but, and all of them aren't musicians. Mm -hmm. Every day somebody's crying the blues, man, sitting in an office somewhere. And uh, it's just a, a way of, of getting a bad feeling out of you, to cry the blues, you know. And uh, you, you really do have to live the blues to play the blues. It's never been from here up. It's always been from the whole being in me. I learned that from my grandmama. Son, you got to put everything you got into it. So, and also Janice Joplin told me uh, every time you you do it, man, do it like it's the last time you'll ever do it because you don't know when you're going on. So I learned that from Janice. You had a friendship with Janice Joplin. What was she like when she was not? She was a female you? version of the mojo. <laughs> <laughs> With boobs. <laughs> <laughs> Wide open. <laughs> I loved her, man. Yeah. She loved to get a, uh, get drunk and hang out with people. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And sing the blues. You know, the story about that whole thing, was, uh, Chet Helms had this thing uh, who was uh, had the family dog. And family dog in San Francisco was the rival club to the Fillmore, which was Bill Graham's thing. So Bill would never book Janice at the Fillmore because she was in the house band at the Avalon with Big Brother. I uh, used to open for her at, at the Avalon in 67, 68, before I got to play at the Fillmore. Mm -hmm. He was real picky about who he had play there. But uh, we were on tour we had to tour out of uh, San Francisco because uh, there were so many bands and all of them would play for nothing. Uh, money was not, not not to be found in, in San Francisco for, unless you were Steve Miller or one of the headlines, you know. So it was all we had to tour. So we were touring with a band called The Count Five. They had a, a hit song called Psychotic Reaction mm -hmm. and on the East Coast. And we got a call from uh, Janice. She said, Bill's going to finally book me at the Fillmore, and I want your band to open up for me. So we drove all the way from New York and which to the band Fillmore. Was that? that was the initial shock. That was initial shock, we, okay. We were a four piece unit from Missoula, Montana. And uh, we had the largest sound system of any band there, even the dead. They, their PA sucked. They hired us pay us 50 bucks to open up for them and use our VA. That was how, how I got to open a lot of shows because we uh, we had toured the Northwest for two or three years. But anyway, I got to open for Janice at the Fillmore. That was one of the highlights of my life, man. Mm -hmm. But she did offer that night to for me to get shot up and stuff, and I didn't want to. I, I just have a fear of needles, and I think to this day, that's one reason I'm still here, because a lot of them are. Yeah, yeah, very sad. And it was, uh, it's always been a 
if I did a drug, I would always try to control the drug and never let it control me. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, how did you find your way out to hate Ashbury? And well, we were we were opening a show for Paul Revere and the Raiders in Missoula, Montana. And it uh, went real well. And then we did one the next night with the Kingsman, who did Louie Louie. And they told us, hey, man, something's happening down in uh, Berkeley and Haight-Ashbury, uh, San Francisco. You guys ought to check it out. So we sent our, both our roadies down there for a weekend. And they came back in two weeks, man. <laughs> they had everything you could think of. And I, I'd never done anything but drink a beer. And I mm -hmm. thought that was cool. So we said, well, we're going to have to move on down there and check it out. And that's how we got there. What did you think of this whole exodus? You know, just what was your take on it? What I loved it because uh, initial, the Chosen Few is the band that opened up for the Kingsman and uh, and uh, the Whalers and uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders. We were a six-piece show band that all wore outfits, leather outfits with knee boots. And, you know, we we had a Paul Revere and the Raiders outfit too. <laughs> you know, so when we moved down there, we were able to leave all that stuff behind and just play barefoot with jeans and t-shirts. I love that. <laughs> Not having to dress up anymore. <laughs> I kind of thought you enjoyed dressing up. Was well, <laughs> I, I I still do like to look. My dad always said, "Son, if you can't sound worth a boot, you can always look." Right. <laughs> and so, just to get back to hate Ashbury, what do you think that all of those people, you know, that congregated there, you know, what were they looking for, and did they find it? Uh. I would have to say uh, some place to crash. <laughs> there were a lot of people on the street with nowhere to go. <laughs> I had 11 dates one time in, in one day. 11 women stopped by. Lord have mercy. It was the free love, uh, the free spirit, you know, just not really caring and, and saying, hey, the heck with you, I want to do it like this, man. Uh -huh. You know, I, 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 I really like that movement. But then it got, it turned sour after a few years and there were a lot of riots. And, yeah. and uh, I, I moved out of Haight over to Marin County, stayed out there, Sausalito, Stinson Beach. But I loved the Haight. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a, such a great experience living right around the corner from the Grateful Dead on Masonic Street. They lived on Ashbury. I wasn't more any further than here to uh, turn, I mean, uh, the Poe House to their house. I used to hang out over there all the time. But, you know, they were a, a great band, but they were called the Warlocks when I met them, 66, early 67. And uh, there's a few places that they played. They played a lot of biker gigs. You know, they were kind of known as the rowdy biker band. And uh, that's kind of how they got to start. But they were backed in part by Stanley Owsley, or Owsley Stanley, who had the formula for LSD, 25, developed it for the Army, and brought it out on the street. Took made millions with it and back to Rake for Dad, that's how they got it. I remember when they first got their record deal and went to LA, they they sent a note back, everybody was checking on them and stuff. Man, they must have been in there nine months. <laughs> and uh, they, they spent $400,000 on their first album, man, recording time. Wow, Because none of them really could sing. Jerry could play the, yeah. Bill Lesh was a good, man, you know, the, but they weren't really known as singers. Mm -hmm. And that's what was the hardest part for them, working out their vocals. But I opened for the dead a few times. As a matter of fact, our initial shock is on the Fillmore poster that's the most sought after one in the collector's series. I'm really proud of that. Cool. 
And uh, did you uh, get to talk with Jerry much? Did you guys talk yeah, guitar? Yeah, I did a lot of drugs with Jerry. Everybody would sit around the big hookah in his living room. And they'd sprinkle uh, PCP on the weed. And that would send you out there. Yeah, I talked with Jerry a few times. He, uh, he was kind of a loner, I have to say, you know, because he was Jerry Garcia, you know. He'd let people in his living room, but he'd usually go in another room. Hmm. Same thing when he, a lot of the other people that I met, uh, Carlos, uh, Chuck Berry, they were all loners, man. They didn't really want to talk to you. They were getting ready for their show. But uh, I, I did, I, I, I met so many people at the Fillmore. I must have opened uh, 20 or 30 shows over a period of six mm -hmm. years there. And uh, some, a lot of them were outside. I played once in the polo fields in Golden Gate Park and it was 38,000 people. There was so many people and it was like the music would reach them in waves. You could see them were reacting to them for as far as you could see, man. That was mind-boggling. Hmm. Yeah, I opened for the dead that day in Janice. Yeah, I had fun, man. I wasn't a great musician or a great singer, but I, I was good enough to get by. <laughs> you know. It's hard to believe that there was ever a time that you weren't great, but I'll, I'll go along with that. You know, I, I mean, when you stand next to Carlos Santana and you, you think you're a <laughs> okay. guitar player, you go, well, uh, it's about well, time to go back to woodshed in a little bit. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, what, what did you think of Jerry's chops? You know, I, I love Jerry. He, yeah. he played the fluid, fluid yeah, yeah. uh, two-note stuff like my dad played. And right. I, I, that's kind of where I... My dad had taught me that style, but Jerry played it. And I, like I said, if you listen to me, you hear a little bit of everybody mm -hmm. in me, man. Real fluid player, smooth. I did a show at uh, Norfolk, uh, Virginia Beach, Friday, for the Life Rolls Home benefit. And uh, I had a guy come up after I finished, and he said, he said, man, you're smooth. You're a smooth guitar player. <laughs> You know, he didn't say, you're great, you're, you're wonderful, it's, you're smooth. <laughs> Thought that was pretty cool. Carefully chosen words. Yeah. Now you got a gig, uh, I guess you were backing up Chuck Berry for one of his... Initial shock backed up Chuck Berry four nights at the Fillmore, plus Steve Miller was on tour. Okay. I'm Steve big, always uh, backed Chuck up when he came to town. I'm a big Chuck Berry fan, so yeah. tell me, tell, give me the goods. <laughs> well, Chuck was one of them guys that had the 50-50, but he was leaning more towards big head and white boy, get out of my way, kind of. He was uh, sort of a racist in his own way against whites, whereas a lot of whites hated blacks mm -hmm. still, you know, stuff. But, so he was my idol. Yeah. I loved, I played every lick he ever mm -hmm. played on the guitar, and uh, I enjoyed the four nights that I did play with him, but there was one night when he looked at me like, take a break, go for it. So I was just burning it up on Johnny Be Good or something, and he came over and grabbed the guitar and stopped me right and grabbed the mic, and he goes, hey, this is my show, white boy, <laughs> push me off. That's a truth statement. That was at the film where I felt so ashamed. I stood over in the shadows and just played rhythm behind him for the rest of the night. He, uh, quite a showman, man. He was a you little know. salty, you know, but, uh... Quite a show. Yeah, but quite, quite a performer. I hated that he had to sing my ding a -ling before he got a stand up <laughs> <laughs> That's why he was a little salty. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Never looked at it like that. <laughs> now, I went, I went to see you a couple of weeks back, and a lot, a lot of the music you play is undeniably the blues, but I also hear Elvis, and I hear Chuck Berry, and I hear what I would describe right. as just classic, real driving rock and roll. So how, how, do, you, uh, how do you compare the difference between... No, or what's the relationship, I guess, between, you know, classic rock and roll and the Muddy Waters blues, the electric blues, you know? Well, when Bob Dylan first went electric at the Newport Jazz Festival, I think it was, you know, he got booed. It was a uh, most rockabilly artists like Elvis all played acoustic. 
there wasn't really a lot of electric stuff going on. Even Johnny Cash had a twanger, you know, and Scotty Moore with Elvis. But, uh, well, rock and roll was born out of, out of the blues. Rock, rock and blues, you know, Buddy Guy was one of the first ones to so learn from Muddy. And I try to, to carry the root, because I do a trio as much as I can, and then play the lead over the top of it, which is kind of sort of what a lot of guitar players did. Now, Chuck, he would just rock it out on the top and play the rhythm on, on the, when he sang. And I, I learned I learned that from him, also from my dad. But the blues kind of, like Muddy said, the blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll, mm -hmm. you know. And I, have, I can't forget that the British invasion had a big influence in my life too, because we used to do a Beatles set, a Stone set. We did a lot of English music, Yardbirds. Yeah. Uh, uh, matter of fact, I got, got to uh, ride through Nashville once uh, in a Yardbirds parade. They were going to play somewhere. And we kept, were coming through town headed to play with that band. I was telling you about the uh, psychotic reaction, count five. And somehow we got in the line of the parade and went right, it was the Dick Clark Caravan. We rode right through, <laughs> just like we were somebody waving <laughs> in our Cadillac in our old Plymouth. Now we, we went in style, man. We had a 58 Cadillac limousine and a 47 Plymouth limousine, both of them painted silver with gold sparkle pinstripe. Yeah, they were first class vehicles. They were gutted from the front seat back so we could put our equipment in each one and two guys would ride in each vehicle. I remember driving them things from Seattle once to Wrightsville Beach. I played 97 days in a row. A place called uh, Lumina Pavilion mm -hmm. in Wrightsville Beach. It was a summer gig. Years later, I went out and moved to Wilmington. There was a little gal came up to me and said, look at this. She had a scrapbook and she opened it up and there was a picture of me giving her a nickel to call me when she grew up. And that's how much telephone calls were back then. <laughs> 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 you mentioned the British invasion and all that that was going on. A lot of musicians that I've talked to that lived through that have told me, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, that I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and I became a rock and roller. Why do you think you, you know, decided to stick with the blues for lack of a better term. Well, the Beatles needed really to learn the root. That's why they stole it from me. <laughs> <laughs> I taught them some. <laughs> no, I never met the Beatles. I, I, I really appreciate their work. And I think they're probably the greatest band ever uh, all around. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I respect them immensely. And I'm, I'm, Big Beatles and Stone fan, the Stones are out again, still touring, and, and they're all my age and older, man. It just gives me so much inspiration, to, mm -hmm. you know, to keep going. I just hope I die on stage, <laughs> getting it <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm had a good life, and I'm kind of ready to go. British Invasion, I think the Who, were probably the, one of the best rock, rhythm rock bands going live. You know, I saw them all. I saw every one that came, man. They all played the Fillmore, and I, uh, I I worked for the Fillmore. I got in the back door. I got to see probably three or 400 shows over a period of six years, all free. But, you know, you could. I saw Jimi Hendrix four nights in a row. It was only $3 to see him. Mm -hmm. Wow. He, he was getting 300 bucks a night. Yeah, unbelievable. I, I was backstage when Bill brought his check and stuff and paid him. Uh -huh. 1,200 bucks, four big nights. Hey, you rich man. <laughs> uh, Jimmy wasn't too happy about that. Uh, he packed it every night, man. I, 
I read somewhere that the Supremes played a week of shows at the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia for $300. Eight uh, shows. One one of the days was two shows. <laughs> it was never about the money. I guess not. I it's guess it's not. still not, not right. that way. Right. Yeah, there were a very select few that could make it through to the other side. You know, a lot of those people have problems. So I knew a lot of rich people. You know, some of them are dead now because yeah. they just couldn't handle it. If I'd have been rich, I'd have probably been dead. Yeah. I. I I think there's something to that. <laughs> you know, I really do. You if know. I was rich uh -huh. now, though, I, yeah. I've been uh, transformed. I, I would help as many people as I could I, that I, needed it. That's what I would like to do, too. You know. And I do that by doing benefits, which are my favorite gigs now that I'm uh, a little older. Yeah. I was 23 during the Summer of Love. Yeah. 67. You were just the right age. Well, I'm <laughs> telling you, man. <laughs> it was a... It was literally a trip. Yeah. It never, it never stopped. It was twenty-four hours a day, man. You know, sprinkle a little this on your cereal, and sprinkle a little that on your in your coat. I, uh, I am so fortunate that I'm still around. Yeah. But uh, God has me here for a reason, and uh, I'm. A lot of people say that I'm blessed them with my my talents, and I, uh, I, I, I hope I do. I hope I am able to reach people and let them feel the music, not just listen to the music, because the blues is about the feeling; it's not just the hearing. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like you come from the Carolina blues tradition, or have you followed more in the Delta blues, Muddy Waters? Well, the Carolina blues to me was a thing called beach music, <laughs> and I never could get in a beach music band. Mm -hmm. I just didn't like that kind of music, and I couldn't play it. So uh, when I left to go to the Air Force, I, I took my, uh, I had a silver tone F-O single cutaway guitar through an old silver tone amp. I think it might have cost a hundred dollars for both of them. Mm -hmm. That's what I put my first band together with. But uh, I think that because I left North Carolina and had all these other varied influences, now I can play beach music. Now it don't bother me. You know, I'll jam in any beach music band. David Hicks from the Band of Oz. I used to change his diapers. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I grew up right next to him, <laughs> and I used to babysit him. Him and his brothers. And what went into your decision to make your home here on the Outer Banks and play music here, as opposed to say going to Nashville or Chicago or someplace like that with more of a active? Well, when I came back from California in '72, I met my wife, who was uh, in a divorce thing with her husband, and she had a five-year-old son, Scooter, and uh, I started hanging out with her. I would have probably gone back to California if it wasn't for her. And she got offered a job uh, in Nags Head, a real nice job at the Galleon Esplanade, dressing windows, doing advertising and merchandising. And so we came down for a weekend, and that was uh, 46 years ago, man. I never loved. It just, I tell people, man, I used to have this 47 Plymouth that burned more oil than it did gas. And, <laughs> We'd go riding down the road, me and her and Scooter, and he'd be up on that round thing in the middle, and the floorboard was all rotting out. <laughs> it was the doors were roped shut. But uh, that that was, you know, tomorrow I'm playing the 44th or the 45th anniversary of Jockey's Ridge for Carolus's birthday. You know, I wrote that song in 74 to save Jockey's Ridge and yeah. got me into fourth grade history books. They've what? called me every year for 44 years to play that for them. Yes, you, you've been known for your work in the community. In fact, you are a recipient of the Order of Longleaf Pine Society's most prestigious award. Congratulations on that. Thank you. That was a humbling uh, shock. That was presented to me by my pastor at my church, through the church. 
and this, some of the elders in the church felt that I should be recognized for some of my efforts that I had done with the Lighthouse and Junkies Ridge and Chickamacomico and a few other things, benefit work. And uh, they wrote a letter to the governor and next thing I know I got this award hanging on my wall and I'm so humbled by it. Uh, I just really don't feel like I deserved it, but there it is. It's nice to be recognized. It's it, it 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 was forty years ago I wrote this song, man. And what other causes are you involved with now, or, or uh, are you thinking about getting involved with? It? Uh, I'm just trying to do the mojo calls right now. <laughs> this past year has been unsettling yeah. financially, to say the least, yeah. and uh, it's it's. It's been a struggle, but uh, we're coming out of it, and I, I can see uh, I can see the light down the road. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. What other music projects do you have? Do you have another CD in the works? Uh, I am working on material for a new CD. I'm thinking it's going to be just me and the guitar. Mm -hmm. Got bucket style, kick in the box, back to the root. How are you doing with your songwriting right now? Do you feel like this? You know, I'm not a forced writer, mm -hmm. and I wait for the inspiration to hit me. So after a couple of glasses of wine and a few cigars, I, it hits me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and what advice would you offer to a younger person that's just starting out in music or is just thinking about? Don't music? drink or smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, go, go buy yourself a guitar and get into it. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think we need a few more guitar players out there. You yeah. know, music is the rhythm of life. Yeah. You know, everything I see and 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 feel is is a a, a note from some song somewhere. Yeah. You yeah. know, and you, I, I still am fluent in my writing and I, I've just written a couple of instrumentals I think are really cool. So given all the people that you've opened for and that you've worked with, let's say you're in your car and on the, on the radio a Grateful Dead song comes on or a Janis Joplin song comes on, what is, you know, what feelings or what memories, you know, come up for you? Well, I usually just shake my head and turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll be truthful with you. I don't listen to anybody else's music. I never have. I don't want to be influenced anymore. I want to do what I do and what I've get gathered up. I, I, now it's time to put the flowers in the vase and, and, and let them shine a little bit. Let me shine. So if you're on a long road trip, uh, going somewhere, you're saying there's no music in the car at all, or you're listening to the news? Uh, if I listen to anything, it's my music. I really? try to hone my own songs and sing harmonies to them, and there are other parts in there. I, you can actually hear one little phrase in a song, and, and it'll stick in your head. Next thing you know, you've written another whole song from just that one little riff, you know? You know, I wish I could do that. I hate listening to my own music, so it's like the last thing I want to listen to. <laughs> well, I have to force myself. I, I think, I think you do more. have to force yourself. Because, yeah, it's like, I cringe listening to my own music. I just go, oh, my God. Oh, well, I don't think <laughs> Maybe I'm not as good as you as what it is. Well, uh, <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> it's not a matter of good, man. It's just a matter of, of enjoying what you do and having a good time doing it and never do it for the money, always do it for yourself. Always play for yourself, not for the people. If you please yourself, you're gonna please the people. Hmm. Is that what you do? Yes. Hmm. You notice I close my eyes when I play yeah, a lot? Yeah. I go uh, to the Mozone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Mozone! <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that you've had a brilliant career. I think anyone that gets to play as long as you do, and not only play, but play what you want to play. You know, you're playing your music, you know. Yeah. I think you've been, you know, wildly successful. You know. Well, playing. it's it's been a great ride, mm -hmm. and uh, like I said, I'll reiterate, it's not mm -hmm. about the money, it never right. has been. And I, I saw how hard my dad worked, and we barely made it. We struggled, we lost our house to this or that, and had to move and stuff. And, it, you know, he still carried on with it. 
and it gave me so much inspiration and my grandmother Lorraine instilled into me you know give it all you got son how much do you feel that you know when you're performing do you feel like you're carrying your father's legacy uh, to a certain uh, degree and point I have people mention it to me people that have played with him in the past that still live and uh, I heard one of your songs man it sounded like your dad yeah you know like you know I never I could never be as good as he was he was just phenomenally talented and uh, piano and guitar and he sang too but um, he just liked to have a good time. I went to one of my first gigs I went to when I was five years old was at a barn dance in Clayton, North Carolina with the Homer Bowhopper and the Dixie Dudes. And it was an electric instrument in the band. It was a dobro, upright bass, banjo, fiddle, and acoustic guitar. And the drummer did have a snare that he played with brushes. So but it was all acoustic. They had a great time for three or four hours. Everybody was dancing. The guy came up and gave him a big fistful of money, and I looked at him. I said, "Man, that's what I want to do. Have a good time and get paid doing it." <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's pretty much my story too. <laughs> but yeah. You can get paid to play music. Oh, yeah, I'm wow, for that. man! Yeah. Uh, there have been uh, shows. Um, in the past where I, I I was paid very handsomely and uh, I felt like I, in some instances, like I didn't really deserve it, but. So you mentioned that uh, when you met Muddy Waters, approximately what year was that? 62. Okay, so he was enjoying his comeback oh, yeah. at that point, but yes. he had been quite down and out in, in the years be before that. So. Yes, well, he was born out of Louisiana, mm -hmm. I think, and uh, I went to Louisiana during the 80s to experience and went to his house mm -hmm. and, and sat on his porch and, and felt the vibe of the muddy, you know, his, where he was born and stuff. And uh, he, was, he was still playing. I, I did a show with him in uh, Norfolk, Virginia at Robes Gallery, one of the last ones he, before he passed on. And, uh, I, uh, he didn't remember me hmm. from Chicago, but, you know, I, I thought he would because, you know, being a white boy and all that, but he'd been down the road and he, he, he did a lot of drinking, man. I'm sure life was a blur for him at that point. Yeah, being raised in Louisiana, if you ever been to Louisiana, man, it's like going back in time 50 years, you know, it's just a way of life and the mm -hmm. people don't know any different. And uh, I, I kind of like that. Yeah. I, I, I might die and go down there and live for a while. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the whole 60s blues revival? And do you think anything like that could ever happen again? Well, I'm really thankful for guitars like Clapton and Beck and Page and, and uh, all, all the great guitarists, Jimmy, that came from there and, and brought the root and, sh and turned it on to the white audience, right. the Dick Clark audience mm -hmm. of uh, America. Because up until the time they came, when a black guy had a hit, like got my mojo working, it was usually a white guy that redid it and got the credit for it. It was usually Pat Boone. Or somebody like that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Johnny Rivers, and, you know, um, uh, they, they were just, like like uh, when I opened up for uh, Big Mama Thornton at the Avalon, she came out and she said, man, I'm going to do that song that that white boy from Memphis stole from me. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. no. Well, I think that's why some of these guys, like you mentioned Chuck Berry before, why they were a little bit better because they felt like they were getting cut out of the loop. They were getting cut out of the payday that... Yeah. They would have some other singer would come and have a bigger head. One thing about Chuck, man, he always traveled solo. He never had a band. Yeah. He always yeah. picked some, picked up somebody. Yeah. I saw him play one night with Can Heat at the Whiskey. Uh -huh. 
you know? Yeah. There were a lot of people who backed him up. Steve he Miller. played with Springsteen one night in Jersey. You know, they just wanted, you right. know, they just wanted to do it, you know, because he had a lot of fans. Oh, wow. Yeah. Bruce, he's the, he's the man. Cool. I like Bruce. Hmm. I, I I like Billy Joel. I think he's on the the lines of uh, Paul McCartney, America's Paul McCartney. They, they sound a lot alike to me in their uh, the way they approach songwriting and the vocal delivery. Kind of classical influence. Yeah, I'd say both of them. Yeah. How would you like to be remembered? I really wouldn't. I'm not gonna have a gravestone. My ashes will probably be strong on Jockey's Ridge. I really don't, you know, I, I'm looking for glory on the here and beyond. So you're and, not? Uh, this was just a learning process for me, and when I get there, I'll, I'll graduate. So you're not working on your legacy, you're working on your next go round. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready to go. I've had a good life, and if I went right now, I'd. I wouldn't have any regrets. I, I just hope that I'm not a burden to anybody. When I, I have suffered through in the past even with my mom and dad and my grandparents, long and, and tedious deaths. And uh, I, I would just, you know, just smoke a couple of cigars, drink a couple of glasses of wine, and blow my brains out and I'll be ready. You know, <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> Nah, I, 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 <laughs> believe me, one of my guitar players did that. God. All right, so there's nothing to laugh about. Here, I really hope that you don't go that route. Right. I think as long as you're playing as well as you're playing, you know, uh, I, I can't. Uh, I'm so blessed, man. I yeah. do have arthritis in both my hands, yeah. but I. I suffer every night, but I, that's just part of the blues. We all suffer for our art. There's no way around it. That's so true, man. But yeah, art is about suffering. It, yeah. But art, yeah. music is art. Absolutely. And art relates to music. Well, I really want to thank you for uh, coming by, and it's been a pleasure talking with you and I, I hope that you'll come back again maybe in a little while give us an update on um, um, whatever you got I hope going I'm on. still around I hope and, so too. Uh, I hope you know, so too. We'll, uh, we'll sit down and have a cigar. Let's do this again. Wine. Let's do this every six months <laughs> as right. long as you're here. All right, <laughs> man. God bless you. God bless you, Mojo. Thank you, Thank you so much. God bless you.